We welcome you at the technical forum at the group exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells 2013. Please have a seat, have a free drink. You are really invited to listen to the next presentation and ask some questions at the end. Come and enjoy here with us the next presentation by ITM Power. The topic is High Pressure Rapid Response Electrolysis. It is presented by the CTO, Dr. Simon Byrne. Come on, give me some big hands for Mr. Byrne. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about uh, high pressure rapid response electrolysis and particularly its role in grid balancing. Uh, the topics I'm going to cover um, is uh, a quick introduction to the company, um, say a little bit about um, what the issues are with balancing the grid, particularly frequency control, and then talk about the, um, the definition of a rapid response electrolyzer, what an electrolyzer would need to do to be able to help with some of these issues. I'm going to touch on power to gas and how that plays a role in this area and um, then talk a little bit about how we're gathering data and um, learning more about this area ourselves. So for those of you that don't know, ITM is essentially an electrolyzer company and we're interested in hydrogen energy systems, principally for energy storage and clean fuel. There's three main markets that we're interested in. The first is clean fuel, which is potentially very large. Um, the middle one is energy storage, which is something that's most relevant to this presentation, and also renewable heat. So we feel that electrolysis has got a significant role to play in all of those three areas, um, as shown pictorially there. So first of all, grid balancing then. Um, what I want to try and do is say, um, in very general terms, what some of the issues are. Um, when it comes to frequency, the grid uh, operates at, f at uh, 50 hertz, and that's defined by rotating machinery. It's the turbines spinning in the, um, in the generation um, that run at, at 3,000 RPM. And there's some very tight controls over that. That, that frequency isn't allowed to deviate by um, very much from 50 hertz. And some of the things that can influence that are excessive load on the grid or excessive supply. And this seesaw is really trying to show how the two have to be balanced together to maintain the right frequency. So the picture of the power station, if there's uh, greater generation, then the frequency will rise because the turbines will spin faster. And if there's excess load, then the, the turbines will slow down and the frequency will drop. And the analogy I've used here is a uh, car engine. If the engine runs too slowly, it will stall. If it runs too quickly, the engine ultimately will blow up. So what are the things that can be done to try and help keep this frequency where it should be? Well, if you consider the case of rising frequency, you can either back off some of the generation or you can add more load to try and keep the, uh, the frequency in, at, at 50 hertz. In the case where the frequency is falling, you can uh, do, do the opposite. You can turn on more generation to help uh, speed everything back up again, or you can turn off loads. And what we're used to doing is doing everything on the supply side. So it's mainly been about controlling how we generate power and how we increase and decrease that generation. We've not done much on the demand side. So looking in a bit more detail at that supply side, this is a range of different power, um, power stations. This slide comes from Nas National Grid. And what it does is show the response time of different generation techniques and also their carbon footprint. And it ranges all the way from nuclear, which has got a, a low carbon footprint, but it takes two days essentially to turn on or off, um, down to hydro, which is, uh, which is very rapid. But in the UK, there's not many um, appropriate geological structures for us to exploit that. But what's changing is that we're deploying more and more wind power. And that kind of erodes our ability to keep this balance, this seesaw level, by modifying power generation because increasingly the, it's the strength of the wind that's defining what our power generation looks like. So we're having to look more at the, de at the, um, at the demand side. Quick snapshot, these uh, numbers come from the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and what it shows is the growth of wind power in the UK and 
2013 is an important year because that's the level where we hit a particular threshold, which is 20% by capacity or 8% by energy, which is when you start to bump into serious curtailment issues. So that means that the amount of wind power that is available to us outweighs the instantaneous demand. And we see from other countries like Germany and, um, and Denmark, where they are further down the line of deploying renewable power, that this issue actually happens. So it's not a, a modelling exercise. This is based on fact and evidence from other countries. So OK, if, if we're to look at um, putting a, 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 a rapid response electrical load in the system to help with frequency control, what would it need to do? This again is something from National Grid and what it, what it shows is how the, the grid frequency will oscillate around 50 hertz. If there's some sort of instance, in this case there's a dropping frequency, so it may be the loss of a power station for some reason. You need to be able to react to that situation very, very rapidly so that you can recover. And what, um, there are different um, uh, response times that define um, uh, certain characteristics. So if you were to look at where the, uh, the frequency starts to fall, if you were to turn off lots of electrical loads very quickly, you can help recover that, uh, that, that frequency. So to try and make a bit more sense of that and turn that into something a bit more financial, National Grid in the UK have defined a set of grid payments. So if you're able to offer um, a rapid response, you can uh, uh, gain some payment from the, from the national grid in terms of uh, um, offering that service. So I'm going to try over the next few slides to describe those in a bit more detail. Uh, on, the, uh, on the supply side, um, there is, uh, there's a need to define the, uh, the response time. And broadly speaking, the quicker you can respond, the higher the payment you can attract. And you also need to be able to define the duration that you can offer. So in this case, you'd need to be able to turn uh, electricity generation on and to attract the most lucrative payments on the primary side, you'd need to be able to do it in around a second and be able to keep that going for about two hours. On the demand, demand side, it's very similar. Um, again, the faster you can respond, the more payments you can attract and you need to be able to respond in uh, one second and be able to keep that, uh, keep that load off the grid for about two hours. But it's not just speed and time, it's also scale. And to qualify for the, the payment terms in the, in the UK, you need to be able to uh, operate at three megawatts. So what you can do is have one lump of three megawatt load, or you can aggregate up three one megawatt loads to get to that, uh, that payment level. Um, if you boil all of that down, an electrolyzer able to um, respond in a way that attracts the best payment structure, it would need to be capable of operating at 3 megawatts. It would need to be able to be turned all the way off or all the way on in less than two seconds. And that is a, f um, uh, a series of characteristics that we've worked quite hard um, to ensure our electrolyzers can deliver. So moving a little bit further on from that, if you're able to do this, um, what can you do with the hydrogen? Well, there's a great appetite for hydrogen for fuel, and a lot of that's uh, uh, on display here. Um, another uh, application is to supply that hydrogen into the natural gas network. So the rationale here is to be able to balance the electricity network and the gas network. At any one time, there's usually around three times more energy flowing through the gas network than there is through the electricity network. So that's one point. The other is that there is inherently no storage on the electricity network, but there is a lot of bulk storage on the gas network. We have the ability to convert gas into electricity through uh, gas-fired power stations, but what we don't have is the ability to effectively convert electricity into gas. And electrolysis is a mechanism of doing that. These diagrams can rapidly get quite complicated, so I'm, I'm going to try and summarize it very briefly. There are two main mechanisms for converting electricity into, into gas um, and delivering it into the gas grid. The first is to generate hydrogen via electrolysis and inject that hydrogen directly into the gas grid. 
if you do that, there are some certain um, uh, pieces of legislation that you need to comply with, and you need to um, respect certain maximum levels of hydrogen introduction. And they vary depending on what country that you're in. The other mechanism is to deliver hydrogen into a methanation plant that will combine the hydrogen with CO2 from the atmosphere and turn it into synthetic natural gas. Now there's no limit on how much synthetic natural gas you can put into the gas grid. Either way, the electrolyzer is the key piece of equipment. And if that electrolyzer is able to have the rapid response characteristics that we've just talked about, um, the, the, cost of that the cost of making that hydrogen is significantly reduced. To bring that into a bit more context, this is a, a picture of a piece of plant that's designed to do just that. This is around a third of a megawatt. It has um, um, PEM stacks inside it that are able to respond in one second. They're also capable of self-pressurizing to 80 bar. And that's quite important because that means that if you wanted to in introduce hydrogen into any of the gas network, whether even the highest gas, gas net, uh, pressure network, you don't need to use a compressor. You can simply bleed the hydrogen in directly. The uh, next slide shows you a picture of the stacks. Um, each of those stacks is capable of generating 25 kilowatts of, uh, sorry, kilograms of hydrogen a day. And it's a, a modular platform so that you can fit up to a megawatt in one 20-foot ISO container. But the flexibility is there to offer um, a, range of, um, a range of sizes. The market isn't developed enough yet to have one size fits all. So the, the area of power to gas is, um, is, is attracting a lot of attention. Um, and we, um, we're doing a project that's funded by um, uh, the, the Technology Strategy Board in, uh, back in the UK and we're partnering with uh, Scottish and Southern Energy, National Grid and Shell and what that project is doing is looking at the, the three key areas that are um, essential to understand to, to deploy this equipment properly. The first is the, any technology gaps that exist. Does the electrolyzer hardware do all of the things it needs to do to, uh, to operate in the right way? What are the compliance issues with introducing hydrogen into the gas grid? How do you define all of that and how do you work it? And last of all, but mo arguably most important, is what are the different business models that you can use to make money out of doing this? We've all recently sold a, um, a, a, a PEM electrolyzer to the Tuga group of utilities here in Germany. It's going to be located in Frankfurt. And this, um, this unit is designed to take renewable power and convert it into hydrogen and introduce it into the gas grid and help um, the, the group of utilities that make up the, the, the Tuga group get first-hand data for how all of this equipment works and um, what the reliability is and try and work out the most appropriate business model for moving forward. So that was all I was planning to, to talk about I've, and I recognize I've gone through that quite quickly and happy to answer any questions. If you don't want to ask now, I'm more than happy to come to the stand. We're on B60 just over there. Yeah. <coughs> uh, sorry, Simon. I promised I wouldn't ask a question. So. You did. <laughs> but um, thanks again for another very informative and excellent presentation, as always. Um, I just wanted to make a point about uh, methanation, um, because you said uh, taking CO2 from the atmosphere, but actually the CO2 in the atmosphere is uh, very low density, and actually I think for methanation it will require a high density CO2 stream. So are, are we really looking at uh, CO2 coming from uh, fossil fuel uh, generation, or possibly yeah. synthetic gas uh, generation, uh, recycled? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's, it's most efficient to get it from an industrial process where you've got a high density of CO2. But um, you, can, um, you can intercept it just as it's being released into the atmosphere. Yeah. So, sorry for not being here. I have to clear it up something for the, with the problems. So, um, is there are any question left right now? 
Yes. Um, how do you see the future of electrolyzer prices? Um, are they going to come down? Are there, do, do you see some uh, you know, mass markets coming soon? Yeah, I, th I think there are. Um, there's a, a floor level of industrial applications. So hydrogen is used for a variety of different things outside of the three areas of, I, I, uh, I outlined at the start of the presentation. Um, so they, where they can overlap with the same electrolyzer technology, that helps because we can, um, we can increase volume and get cost down in that way. I think that um, the, the cost is generally coming down. Um, that, uh, that's triggered by volume in part, but also uh, technology improvements as, as, uh, as we move forward. I think it's important to flag that uh, our experience is that we are being asked more and more for um, electrolysis around the megawatt scale, and as, uh, particularly with the ability to respond rapidly. And that's normally because of a, uh, a need to assimilate wind power that's, that's by definition quite intermittent. And so it's important to make sure that the technology developed for electrolyzers to bring the cost down is a relevant one and it's able to deal with that intermittency. And, and uh, 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 PEM is very effective of doing that, uh, doing that for a number of reasons. Uh, and and do, you see, do you see that as a particular advantage of PEM over alkaline electrolyzers, um, which, which may be cheaper than PEM electrolyzers in general, is that correct? Yeah, well, there's the, the, there are the two key technologies, uh, liquid alkaline, which is the, um, the, the conventional technology, if you like, um, and PEM electro electrolysis. And the main differences between the two are that um, alkaline um, is very well established. It works very well, particularly for base-loaded um, plant that runs very continuously. And it, uh, because it operates at a high pH scale, the, there are a, a number of extra materials of construction that can be used, particularly the catalysis. Rather than being precious metal, it, uh, it can be um, lower cost materials. Uh, PEM, on the other hand, is, um, is very good at being um, very compact, generating hydrogen at high pressure, so it saves on some of the downstream um, uh, compression equipment that's, that's needed, and it's, um, it's, it's lower temperature so that it, it's particularly good at, uh, at, at, at um, modulation. And, and, and you will look to inject directly into the medium pressure gas grid, is that correct? Yeah, the, 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 there's, there's a few points with that. The, the, one of the attractions of, in, of injecting hydrogen into the high pressure network is that there's a lot more um, natural gas moving through it. So it's easy, it, it, you can put a lot more in before you hit the maximum threshold. However, those, um, those mains go in, in both directions, so the, the hydrogen can find its way out into all different areas. If you introduce into the medium or lower networks, you always know which way the gas is flowing, so you know exactly what uh, pipe works and what, uh, what applications that hydrogen is being um, uh, delivered to. So um, there's interest at all levels, but the early, early um, um, installations tend to be injecting in the medium pressure network. Yeah. Yeah, and also because you you can use the output pressure from your electrolyzer directly, no need for compression, correct? Exactly. Compressors are a bit of a pain because they're expensive, um, they're inefficient and they need a lot of maintenance. So if you can get rid of that and develop the pressure with the electrolyzer itself, it's, it's energetically very efficient, but it also uh, eliminates one troublesome piece of balance of plant. Thanks a lot. Does anybody here from the audience have a question or some remarks left? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Byrne, you. for being here. So if there are, you, have, yeah, you have the opportunity to, to, to discuss anything at the booth at uh, ITM Power here at the group exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells, it's B60 right, here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks Thank very you very much. So at 11 o'clock we will continue here with, with the presentation dealing with the status of eloquent stack development. Thanks a lot.